I am so honored today to be talking about one of, well, hold on, let me backtrack. Not one of, I'm going to just say it, the best short film of the year. It's called The Red Lips of the Octopus, and it tells the romantic story of Aleister Crowley and his lover, Polet. It's done in a beautifully artistic way, and it's also an homage to the work of Kenneth Anger. If you're on my channel, then you probably already know who Aleister Crowley and Kenneth Anger are, but Polet might be a new name for you. Polet and Crowley's relationship was one of the most important relationships of Crowley's life. So the fact that there was a film explicitly exploring their relationship is groundbreaking. It's groundbreaking from a queer perspective, an occult perspective, and also an artistic perspective. I am so excited and so blessed to be here and talk to the director of the film. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, before we get too deep into the Crowley stuff, which I'm super excited to talk about, um, I'd love to hear more about you as the director. So if you could please introduce yourself, share some of your background, and what got you interested in making films? All right. Of course, first of all, hi, Lane. I'm so happy to be on this show and to talk to your followers and to get to chat with you today and have the opportunity to talk about my film. So I'm really honored and happy about that. So, okay, to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Rahel Kapsarski and I'm an artist and filmmaker. I'm actually a painter, but now I'm sort of like, this is my second short film I'm making. So I come from an artistic family of filmmakers. My grandfather was already a filmmaker from Greece. That's where I'm originally from, called Socrates Kapsaskis. He made sort of like art films in the 50s and 60s, but he really like inspired me as well because he thought a lot about cinema and teached me a lot. And then my sister as well, she is a film director for many more years than myself, and we've worked together. We also run our own production company called Upper Bark Productions, and we've done one feature film called Spy Darlings, which was an LGBT musical horror film, which came out in 2016, was distributed by Troma in America. And we've done several shorts and TV series and all kinds of stuff. So it's a filmmaking bug and obsession I love, basically. Yeah. So yeah, that's my yeah, that's... film. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful and it sounds like it really is throughout your entire family this sort of love of the yes. arts and yeah that's really cool so how does your personal background then influence your filmmaking well I'm actually more fine artist I'm a painter like an oil painter and I've studied um, fine art and have a MA in fine art so that's the first time I actually went into making my own film like previously I worked either as an actress or special effects artist producer all kinds of things but I really wanted to take that next step and try to make my own film as in sort of like an so I made my first film called The Curse of a Black Sack which was a stop motion animation film so I used puppets move them took pictures of like an animation which was also again I mean, it wasn't really cool. It was sort of like based on folklore, British folklore, and, and it was a great experience. But now I took the next leap and actually Red Lips. I actually consider that my first film because the previously it was more like an extension of a painting because it was like my own little sets I built and my own puppets. And you don't communicate with anybody there all night. It's just moving little dolls around, taking little pictures to create animation. So, yeah, this is now my first, I mean, I would consider it my first real film and it was just like an amazing experience to make it. And as a painter, I so like, I have a very visual mind and I mostly call myself a surrealist. So I want to bring that also into my films, the whole surrealist dreamlike world that I create. Wow, so I didn't realize that you consider this film your first film and I must say as as a first film what a start what an explosive start um yeah people got to keep an eye on you and your work so um wow awesome and I yeah I was really impressed with it and I think like your creative and artistic spirit and your experience as a painter as well sort of immersing the viewer and the audience and your work really comes across in the film in my opinion so awesome it's good to know all of that so 
how did you discover Aleister Crowley and what made you tell this story in particular? Well, I mean, I could say I've been into magic and occultism for many years now, and I consider myself a practicing, a practicing magician and ceremonial magician. So this is something which has been a passion of mine for, I don't know, as long as I can remember, half my life, actually. How I got into Crowley was, I remember, like, when I was, I don't know, 11, 12, quite young, actually. My oh, wow. Mother, my mother had a 777 in her library. And I sort of, like, talked about magic. And she always talked to us about a lot of stuff. So magic was one of them, actually, of how to really practice it and talk as well about Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism and that's how this book kind of came about and I, I didn't read it right away I think I first read it when I was like 13, 14 it's a difficult first book to read off by a Crowley because it's not really the best introduction because you don't really understand a lot of first it's a lot of shit souls and actually more part of something to understand later on as you go along in your studies of or called or fell or Crowley so but it got me interested, and then slowly I got more interested also in tarot cards and tarot readings, and then again I went back to Crowley with the fourth cards, and and yeah, I started studying the fourth tarots as well, and got the book of fourth, and that's when I started start reading. I'm very much into uh, tarot and. In general, I like have studied several, not just Phelim as a part of. Occultism. I'm also studying Austin Spear and Chaos oh, yeah. Magic. So awesome. this is something I've continuously explore and want to learn more about. It, but I think it's a big part of my life as well. Yeah. So why I chose yeah. yeah. So why I chose the story of Polite? It's basically I just came over the poem, the Red Lips, the one I based my film mm. on. And I just thought this is a, just a really beautiful, heartbreaking, and absolutely threw me in this poem. That's when I wanted to find out more about Crowley's and Police love story and relationship. So I started reading into it. And then I found out more of how many poems he actually wrote about Polite. He dedicated another book about him and how much of a part of his life actually Polite was. And, you can't find much at first when you actually try to google it it's sort of like a basics yeah he was a drag performer and they started dating in university mm -hmm. and then you find sort of like a few little quotes of by Crowley like things which I like like I lived as his wife for six months which I found really sweet but yeah so sort of like it took me quite a lot of research to find all the material I wanted for the how the relationship unfolded, what happened really. And I think this is sort of like this vulnerable part of Crowley is just something I want to bring over because that doesn't get so much in cinema or in portrayed anywhere really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I am so glad you brought that up because I want to give our viewers just a little bit more context because a lot of films and popular depictions of Aleister Crowley explore him as a black magician, which in my opinion, he's not, um, or a spy or a mountain climber. Um, but your film does not. It tells a much more vulnerable and romantic side of Crowley, which I think is incredible. And Basically, you had the courage to break away from these popular depictions and explore a completely new aspect of Crowley and this story. Yeah, I mean, I have seen quite a few Crowley depictions and films which often are very cheesy. So, I mean, there are some good, I'm not saying all of them, so don't take me wrong, but I've seen some really cheesy sort of like stereotype Crowley's with big piece. I mean, 666 and this... <laughs> like what's this and this terrible person or this sort of like really exploit of women and all kinds of things of how they depict him and they don't show him as the intellectual he really was because he was sort of in a really intelligent manner and part of his wonderful personality for example I kind of got through reading Alistair Crowley's Magical Diaries where 
Oh, okay. He sort of, I don't know if you've read it, but it sort of talks a lot about his inner struggles of either his sicknesses or, mm -hmm. or planning his next book or about sometimes sort of like um, his being just stoned or drunk. <laughs> but it's of sounds more of a personal inner struggle as well. So actually, uh, I mean, one thing that I did not bring over was him as a mountain climber. I did have a small segment, actually, that I wanted to show a surreal mountain climbing scene, actually. <laughs> but that didn't... Because actually, he did take Polite once mountain climbing, and Polite refused to climb with him up the mountain. And knowing Crowley's history of how well some of his... <laughs> Um, <laughs> climbing expense of other people I don't blame Polly so maybe it does the bullet <laughs> that's so funny but, I didn't know that story actually <laughs> I mean, that's so much... yeah I mean yeah I found quite a lot that was the most research I had to do was finding out about Rowley's and Polly's relationship and it sort of slowly unfolded to me of finding all those little bits and facts about it so yeah yeah, that's really cool. And you can really, I, I really could tell you put so much energy and research and effort into it. And when it comes to the magical aspect, I noticed because of course, I'm I'm a practicing magician as well and ceremonial magician. And I noticed you got a lot of the magic in the film, right? So uh, there was, you know, whether it was a literal demonstration of the lesser vanishing ritual of the pentagram or the really artistic depiction of initiation, uh, my question for you about that is how much research did you need to do on magic and to realize this film? Well, I did actually quite, I mean, I started actually writing the script slowly and then doing the research as I went along, like some basics, like the lesser banishing which of a pentagram was something I already knew. And I thought that was actually a nice thing to put in because it's sort of like a cleansing, simple ritual that I can show in the can duplicate in a film. So that was like an amazing scene to shoot, first of all, because we went to this really beautiful beach, which was uh, outside of London by about two hours. So it had this sort of like really amazing landscape there. And of course, I, it's a silent film, but I made my actor, Jeff Christian, who did just a wonderful job at uh, portraying Crowley, say, of course, as well, we worked to it. And... Mm -hmm teach him the movements, which was like a really great experience as well. So he, in the end, actually said like he felt really rejuvenated by doing this ritual for real, because actually yeah. the ritual, he was doing a ritual and saying the words to it as well. So I did a lot of research further on some things like I didn't know, like uh, if you remember the lamb who appears towards the end. So, because sort of like that is sort of like I took a scrollies. I mean, the main quotes of this vulnerable and magician who reflects back upon his life. But then I also have the other personalities a bit. So, if we play around a bit, like I had the B666 there on the side, and mm -hmm. I had Lamb as well as another kind of alter ego of Crowley. So, one ritual I researched was the Almanandra ritual which he undertook in New York when he actually met this entity, Lamb. There are some people say it's like even alter ego or it was a real mm -hmm. entity or an alien or, or it was a spirit. There are all kinds of takes of what Lamb actually really was. But so like, for example, the end of the film was actually um, something I had read about we encountered through astral travel. Mm -hmm. where he first saw the image of a sheep and then he saw an image of a demonic creature, an image of um, actually heaven portrayed by an angelic type of being. So there are all those different things I read into. So research was definitely a big part of it. Uh, some I knew already as a practicing mm -hmm. magician. Some was completely new to me and just drew me in as I continued writing the story. I mean, I could have continued filming and putting more things into it. And then it's sort of like you actually have to pick what you really want to bring over. And I hope the entire film kind of sounds like a... So you have the subject of initiation, so 
I kind of want the viewer to actually feel a bit like they're going through the own initiation, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I definitely thought it translated really well. Transitions, yep. So, um, let's <laughs> see. Yeah, so I hope that you you get that through and of course the other thing is that this was a very important actually time in Crowley's life because I think that's when he actually kind of made the decision I mean between either police and I kind of continue a normal life or would be normal I don't know or, or following his path of spirituality and magic so that's actually what broke the two of them apart because police was not really interested into spirituality or magic or would really encourage Crowley going further down that path. That's why I saw the in the end I have a scene where they actually break up. I don't want to say too much of spoilers, but yeah. <laughs> people will break <laughs> up. So they actually saw Crowley sort of like studying and he reads a book with Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, which inspired him a lot to, for his own ideas on spirituality and film and everything. So, like, as a starting point for him and Polite being kind of not interested in them to having a quarrel. So, I think actually this part of Crowley's life, what I'm trying to say is, it was sort of like his initiation into his own, who he is about to become and what. His wanting this sort of thriving to wanting to study further and finding out all about what he's supposed to be and magic and this whole world actually unfolding for him, which later brought him into Golden Dawn and later brought him into everything that he was finding. Yep. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, it's a journey really. So, I want to portray this journey in the film and I. Hope that came over. Hope it comes over the viewers. Yep. Yeah. yeah, in in my opinion, it was spot on. So I'm pretty compared to other occultists, I'm pretty out about like what I've done and do. And I've been through a few initiations myself, and I think you captured it incredibly. And um, I think it's going to be a real treat for people who've had similar experiences with initiation, or are looking at this for the first time. So I think it's fantastic and. What was your biggest challenge making this film? Um, I mean, it was at times like, of course, every artist sometimes questions himself of what you want to really show. But besides actually doing my entire research and knowing what to go on the script, the actual process of making the film, I must say, has been absolutely wonderful. Like, I've had I've seen films where I had real issues or. Uh, there are all kinds of things that arise during the course of filmmaking, especially low budget filmmaking, where you actually do everything by yourself. But it has been absolutely amazing, and I just felt blessed throughout the entire film because I got such wonderful people I work with, like Jeff Christian, who played Elsa Crowley. We've worked together on other projects as well, and it's just wonderful. And he also agreed to write the music for me, which was just like really brought the film to life because he wrote this psychedelic rock soundtrack that you hear in the film and that has been absolutely amazing and every actor I cast in it and just was brought so much to it like um <clears throat> yeah um can I say if it felt like really unbelievable of how good it was and it took me about a year to make all to uh, make the entire film. Yeah, From and start, like the actual and in film. Terms, yeah. yeah, yeah. The filming was only done over four, five separate days. Okay, okay. It was a quite lengthy post production because I added like a lot of special effects to it and animation and layers and all kinds of things. But yeah, it was a really great experience. And there's sort of like funny things like throughout the film. Like we shot our first scene um, at uh, somebody's home where we got a little set up and we went to that house not mm -hmm. not knowing what number it was. And then you knocked in. Oh, no. It was, <laughs> it was 93. The house we shot at what? was 93. And we, I was standing there and I couldn't believe it. Like, what are the chances? Wow. Oh, oh my gosh. 
Now you're trying to fix this little like science. I don't know. <laughs> That's so great. And I asked him and he said, like, what is it? I mean, he didn't really know the, what it symbolized. I was like, oh. Because I think it's like, I actually playing a token here at first by putting a 93 or something. But yeah, the, we have a study scenes. We saw that's house number 93. So that's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, so, I'd love knowing that. That's so good. I was about to say, like hearing about yeah. how easy the process was for you. It sounds like, you know, you really had the inertia of the universe just kind of helping I you. Think that's it. Like, yeah, you've had a positive energy throughout the film. And everybody, I mean, Brandon Edwards who plays Young Crowley. That was a little bit tricky to cast because I wanted someone who has that type. Because young Crowley had a sort of an aristocratic feel about him. Like when you see him in pictures, he's really sort of well statue, well dressed, and he has sort of that really grace and elegance about him. And you see pictures of young Crowley. So I wanted an actor to really have that elegance, aristocracy about him, that way of moving, that way of looking. So it wasn't just exactly finding somebody that looks so much like Paul, but having that certain something about him. So that role that I casted, I think, for almost a year for that role. Mm -hmm. And then Brandon Edwards came along and applied for it, thought, yep, yeah, this is it, finally. And then he beat no played poorly. It was just like more amazing in it as well, because he as well is a performer and dancer. And he just had that certain look about him. Uh, and we just had a wonderful chemistry, the two of them together, and worked really yeah. well. Yep. So it was just everything just came together amazingly. Oh, it's so good to hear that. Um, so Kenneth Anger is a man who really needs no introduction. But something Kenneth Anger fans may not be aware of is in his film Fireworks, it was actually the first gay narrative film in the United States. So Fireworks features scenes of sailors and so does your film. Um, were you inspired by Fireworks specifically or was there something else for that particular scene? Uh, yes, definitely Kenneth Anger throughout has been a massive inspiration for me. Um, I wanted to put those little homages in the film that if somebody for kind of anger work, they can sort of see that this homage is this scene or, for example, some of the shots used in the beach ritual as sort of homage a little bit, Lucifer rising in a way it's short. But there is also a certain truth to it, which is the most amazing part because researching police and Crowley's relationship, I found out that once the relationship started going a bit sour, um, Crowley actually went out to the shore and set it up a couple of sailors. And there's wow. actually a whole collection of that that he went and slept. Well, I think two, three sailors was there actually. I mean, there are sort of... so, yeah, so there's that whole proof to it. It's sort of like double elements. It was like when I read that part of. Crowley's history, I just thought, wow, that is too good not to put in. I didn't think that I decided to put that scene in the basically like only three weeks before I already planned shooting some other segments for it. And I thought, nope, no, we need sailors. <laughs> and I cast for it and got another <laughs> up. And yeah, I thought, uh, had the opportunity, of course, a mask kind of Angus fireworks, but it is actually the truth because most of wow. the elements, and of course, there's some fiction or some just surrealism to it and not everything is 100% historically correct but most of the main points in the film are actually of how it happened or somehow it did go like that so yeah so this is Crowley's wild days of <laughs> sailors <laughs> had to go in there wow okay so I actually didn't realize that at all but it's so cool to hear about the different layers <laughs> yeah, yeah awesome <laughs> Yeah. So outside of Kenneth Anger, are there any other particular artists or filmmakers who influence your style? Well, there are lots of like my favorite directors, I would say, like David Lynch and yeah. Alexander Todorovsky and um, Young Frank Meyer. A lot of sort of people make sort of more surreal, weird films. But uh, The Red Lips of the Octopus, another film I got really inspired by besides Kenneth Anger, is called Pink Narcissos, which is a queer underground film. 
um, directed by James Bitgood, who even remained anonymous for many years, and this film came out, and nobody knew actually who first directed it, and it's just a visual masterpiece, which you should definitely check out if you enjoyed Radcliffe, because it really was such an amazing inspiration for me aesthetically, and just every frame of it is just like a painting. The colors of it, of course, red lips is in black and white, but pinkness is just is a most visually stunning film you've ever seen. And it's again about a queer love story, and it has this whole sort of it's, it took so from a bit of idolizing sort of the beauty of a male mm -hmm. and in a queer context. So that definitely inspired me a lot. Uh, oh, that's advice. so interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. And I actually personally have not seen that film and I love queer, <laughs> um, you know, films. So I really yeah. have to go check that out. And I'm sure a lot of viewers will have to as well. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I noticed in the credits, and this is sort of a fun little Easter egg, that there's the characters Grady, Francis, and Wilfred. So my question for you is, are these characters references to Grady McMurtry, Francis Israel Regardi, and Wilfred Talbot Smith? Absolutely. And it's amazing, for example, that you notice something like that. That's <laughs> all. Because exactly that's how I put a little Easter egg in, because... I needed to name all those characters and then I thought actually I named them after real people. So they're not actually reflecting those characters in the film, so they don't represent them. It's just sort of like a little bit thing. If people actually read my credit or I want to follow them, follow the kids. Oh, this person is named after this person. Yeah, yeah so, that's yeah. so great. It's a little bit like so. it's great. Yeah, and cool. I know. And I know occultists, when they watch a lot of films and stuff, we get so excited about little Easter eggs, and the film is absolutely chocked full of them. <laughs> well, yeah. I get excited. I'm like that. I am look also little Easter eggs and things I want to read into more and find out more about what does this mean or how, how did that come about. So, yeah. So I hope other people hopefully look into it or find it more layers because this film is really multi-layered and I put, could probably go on and talk about it for 10 hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I would listen for 10 hours too, <laughs> definitely. This is fantastic. Um, and this is really a question I wanted to ask as an occultist. So without spoiling anything for anyone, the film does explore themes as initiation, like we talked about earlier in this interview. So how do you believe initiation into the Golden Dawn impacted Crowley? And how did you portray that in the film or go about portraying that? Well, as I said previously, um, this part of Crowley's life was very important to exploring further who he's about to become and his whole exploration and finding out about spirituality and magic, which actually led to him later, a few years later, joining the Golden Dawn. So I think I kind of took it as wanting to portray that journey of leading up to him joining the Golden Dawn. And I think that was one of the most important steps of his life and made him a who he become. I mean, he didn't end up, of course, staying in the Golden Dawn and he met people like Yates, for example, who he had a mixed relationship with the best. So the main thing I wanted to bring over in this film is taking the fuel, fuel on a this journey or, or almost like you could even see it as a type of astral travel, like Crowley goes maybe through. I mean, the different takes of even of how somebody could view it is actually anything of that really happening is he actually ever leaving his office is he going for an astral travel is he doing a ritual is he being taken over an entity it's is it just looking back on the time we had with police so i sort of want a few to question of what is actually going on and of kind of like reflecting how somebody feels administration of a magical coven of just like ex being taken over by something bigger than yourself, of being drawn to something, which again reflects polite to again the magic of that whole contrast between all those different subjects. 
if that makes sense. Oh yeah, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, and I that's one thing I think is so cool and so beautiful about choosing to explore these themes and the story and the medium like film is you do have that artistic freedom. And you know, Crowley says it himself, magic is the you know, marriage essentially, I'm par paraphrasing here, the marriage essentially of art and science yeah, um, like in, in conformity with will. So uh, I think that like this is to explore these themes of magic, spirituality, initiation in a film format is so powerful and you do so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. And so I got, I got the big question for you now, and that is, what would you say is the main overarching theme or point you hope people watching the film get from it? That is again actually similar to what I just said because it's a very spiritual film. So it, I don't want to make a single point of telling people actually of how they should take, how they should view the entire story or what they should take from it. I want people to take maybe somebody might view the film and he would just see it as a love story, someone would see his film and he would see it as a spiritual journey. And I want somebody, everybody to take whatever they see in it, which everybody else like could see something different in it. And I hope that I can bring that over the, it's kind of left open to the viewer of how they interpret the story or how they interpret the film and everybody takes something different so that's actually what i hope so it's not a single point i make i think i hope i make many points in a way yeah. that's beautiful yeah. and i'm really excited to ask you these this question in particular because i want to know what else you're up to so what kind of stories are you eager to explore in the future and are there any projects coming up on your horizon that you are particularly excited about well, the next big step for me as a filmmaker is to go one step further and make a feature film. It's a really going to be a big project and I don't, I don't want to give too much away from it yet, but it's going to be a dark fantasy. Oh, so wow. it's going to get... And as well, I have a background in being a puppeteer as well. So I hope to actually make a fantasy film using real puppets instead of say CGI or something a bit like reflecting like old fantasy like labyrinth or legend so it's going to be quite different from that and I'm just writing the script for it so it's still very much in the beginning process of being made so but it's going to be I'm something I'm really excited about to make this dark fantasy and again it will explore different themes and it always reflects back to either myself as a surrealist or my interest in occult and all that. That's so exciting. But, I can't wait um, to hear more about this. <laughs> and that brings me to my next question, which is, of course, where can people find you online and how can they support your work? Uh, it would be lovely, like, if anybody wants to follow me, you can do so on Instagram, Rahakapsaski. If you want to follow the film, The Red Lips of the Octopus, I have a Facebook like page that people can check out and give it a like. And I will keep people updated there. So the future of this film now is we are releasing a anthology called Films Confiscated from Films Profiles, which has been made been in the making for many years, which is three different segments, which are all black and white silent films. So that's gonna be released later either late very late this year or early next year and i will keep my social media updated and then it says red lips is gonna go to several festival by itself and i'm gonna again update everybody of when people can view the film hopefully very soon very so. very cool and awesome so for all of our viewers, um, all of those links are going to be below in the video description so you can be sure and stay up to date with all the amazing upcoming projects that you have coming out. And yeah, I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on and talking to me. 
So thank you so very thank much. You so much for having me and listening to everything. Thank you. That's yeah, really it's you've been cool. an incredible guest and what an incredible film and opportunity to talk about this and talk about magic and mysticism and spirituality. So cool. So thank you so much. And um yeah, is there any any last messages you want to make sure our viewers take yeah. away from this? I think it's perfect. I think I've covered mostly and wonderful. Thank you so much. And so excited to see your future videos and you oh thank amazing. you so much that's such yeah. an honor yeah i i love talking about magic <laughs> and all of that so very cool thank you and thank you so much to all of our viewers and listeners today i appreciate you for being here and as always i am the center of expression for the primal will to good and so are you mm -hmm.